as I was, you were singing that song, Chuck, I was reminded of a passage in John chapter 12. For everything that we do sing ought to remind us of something from Scripture because all of our hope comes from Scripture. But in John chapter 12 and verse uh, 20, the Bible says these words, And there were certain Greeks amongst them that came up to worship at the feast. Amen. We've come to worship this morning. Amen. And oh, how that song just lifts my heart as I think about the Jesus in which I'll see one day face to face. But in verse 21, the same came therefore to, Pit, to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired of him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Amen. And so that's what I pray that you experience as you come here this morning. That as we come with all of the things that's going on in our world, as we, go, as we come with all the things that's going on in our own personal lives and the stories and our families all around us, that this morning you would see Jesus. Amen. Not only see Him, but feel Him and know Him and trust Him with everything that you are. For the Bible says that we're to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind. And strength. Amen. And that's what we come to do to be stirred up by the Word of God to remember all that Christ has done for us and what He's called us to do and to be. And as you see there on your bulletin and your handout there, the front of the bulletin states that I am a role model church member. Last week we saw I am a praying church member. And I prayed it from that sermon. That you learned how to pray a little more passionately, a little more fervently, and a little more directly to those in whom Christ has called us to pray for. Amen. As these words are written by the Apostle Paul to Timothy, remember that all Scripture is inspired by God. Amen. It's breathed out by God and it's profitable for doctrine and correction and reproof and training in righteousness so that every man or woman may be equipped to every good work. Amen. And so I pray that if you're here this morning, as you take your Bibles and do turn to the book of 1 Timothy, as this is one of those passages of Scripture, especially in light of the generations in which we are living, it's one of those passages of Scripture that every time the pastor comes to it, he wants to err and go around it, if y'all know what I mean. These are the hard passages of Scripture to deal with, and in light of society around us and where we are. This is one of those passages of Scripture I told you that lately, this is why this book has been challenged, even to its author, Paul the Apostle, because it doesn't like these words, it doesn't like these concepts, it doesn't like these truths, because it's, it would, they would suppose that some would say it limits them to the abilities and possibilities of what they can do with inside life and faith. And I just want to state here this morning that when I say I am a role model church member, I'm not talking about someone to look up to. I'm talking about being who God called me to be in the role which he has set me, made me, and created me. Amen? This is what we're talking about this morning. So you'll see what I'm talking about as you rise and stand in the reverence of the reading of God's word. And as I come to this passage of scripture, this is not an easy one to handle. And I pray that with great grace you would receive these words. <laughs> so pick up with me in Second, uh, um, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9. Verse 9. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel and shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, and then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Now withstanding she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith and in holiness with sobriety. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we come to you this morning and we pray that you would give us great grace as we look to your scriptures this morning for these marvelous truths to be lifted up, to be applied to our hearts and then to be lived out before the world that we would fulfill the roles in which you have assigned to us as men and as women that we would not, Lord, be stiff-necked and hard-hearted when it comes to your word, but, Lord, humbly and respectfully submitting unto that as we all have to submit to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. May we, Lord, be true role models, not only in the church, but in our homes 
and in the society in which we live. For there is so much confusion in our world today, oh Lord. And I pray that with the time we spend together here this morning, that you would help clear up some of that confusion. And that you would send us out into the world so that people may know that there is a God in heaven and that he is the creator and maker of all things, both man and woman. And Lord, help us to respectfully know our place in and through the spirit and the word of God that set before us today. It's in Christ's name that I pray. Amen. You may be seated this morning. And uh, I'm very sorry. I'm going to have to go over here in just a second because I realized I left my notes in my bag. And y'all know how bad it gets when I don't have my notes. We never leave, right? <laughs> so I want to make sure you get out on time. But as you can notice over there on the table, you see I have some props. And as I began to try to think about a physical way to illustrate the, re the reality of what God is saying here, I thought about first I was going to bring a beach ball and a sledgehammer. Okay? Because both a beach ball and a sledgehammer have both been created. Don't you all believe that? And they were created with, with, with purpose, right? So, uh, but as I began to share with my wife about this illustration, she kind of cautioned me on this one, and I'm going to say thank you to my wife for the wisdom that she shared with me, because a hammer is made for work, a beach ball is made for pleasure. <laughs> so we're going to throw that one away, Mike Bird, we're not going to use that one, because we don't want to get into that, because women weren't just made for pleasure, they have a lot of other things to do, amen? And as men aren't just made to work, there's a lot of other things that men are designed and shaped to do. And so didn't want to go there because I didn't want to offend anybody. So just know that I was corrected this morning on my way to church. <laughs> uh, that's not going to work out very well. The women aren't going to take that too wonderfully well. And so I thought, you know what? Well, hey, you know what? I got something in my toolbox that I believe can under help us to understand this. Now, here we have a drill. And man, I tell you what, men, ha, ha, ha. Or how Tim, Tim, uh, cool man, Taylor, who, ha, ha, you know, ha, you know. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I mean, he saw a Benford, whatever this would have been, a Benford, whatever, whatever, but it's a Ryobi. But this is a drill, and this is a skill saw. Now, both of these things are marvelous creations. They were both made by the same what? Maker. They were both by the same maker, and they both were, man, was intelligently designed. But both of them have an entirely different function. They have a different role to play in the process of which you were, if you were going to build a house, amen, you would use a saw and a what? A drill. One inside of itself, though, could not actually do the full job. If I only had a saw and I had no drill, what I could, I could not put together. Amen? Do y'all see what I'm saying? So while they were both made by the same person and made with tremendous purpose and for a tremendous purpose, they both have different roles and responsibilities in bringing the whole thing together. So I can build a house without a saw and a drill. Now, in my day, we would have used a hammer. How I many of y'all men know that? Before drills, we used a hammer. And that was a lot more work. So praise God that we now have a drill. But no matter what you look at this, and, and notice I, I, this is representing men because you see how dirty and, you know, all it, drills nice and clean and pretty and fancy. And so we say this one's, you know, I'm not going to go there. Okay? But here's, here's another thing. At the bottom of these, something called a battery. And each one of these has to have a battery. Because without a battery, it has no power. So even though it was created for a great purpose and function, if I just gave you these and said go build a house, you'd look at me and say, hey, bro, uh, can I have what? Can I have the batteries? Because regardless of why or how they've been created without the power, they're useless. And I want you to write this statement down because I think this is something that God wrote into my heart as I was getting to this. That biblical truth without spiritual transformation is an abomination. Let me say that again. Spiritual, biblical truth without spiritual transformation is an abomination. In other words, if I came to you and we were going to build a house and I showed up with all of my tools, but I didn't have the power to control them, you'd say, man, what the heck's wrong with you? 
You can't, we can't do anything unless you have what? The power. And so it is with the Word of God. And once you connect connected to the power of God, then you can reach your full potential. But I don't care. We've all been made and shaped and made. But if we don't get hooked up to the power source that makes us actually work and function, guess what we're not going to do? We're not going to function the way we were designed. We're not going to accomplish the task which we've been given to do. And in God's great design, I promise you, He was smarter and better than the person who made this drill. Can I get an amen? God knows how to make things work properly. Amen? And regardless if you don't like it or not, what God says is truth. Amen? And we must hold that truth and we must then uh, display that truth before a world that is being more confused. Y'all listen to me. They don't even know anymore if they're a drill or a saw. And I'm telling you that one of the reasons the world has lost its understanding of who it is is because the church has lost its understanding of what God has said. And we have roles and we have responsibilities. But I'm telling you, you can even come to the Word of God and you can read it. But if you don't take the Holy Spirit of God and apply it to your life, I promise you it will be an abomination to you because you will know what God has said and you have not done it. And that is an abomination unto the Lord. Amen? And so I just want to read a couple of things to you because I saw this little poem and uh, it just really made me uh, think about it. And um, it says, I saw them tearing, tearing a building down, a gang of men in a dusty town. With a heave and a ho and a lusty yell, they swung a beam and the sidewalls fell. I asked the foreman if these men were skilled, as men he had hired, if they were to build. He laughed and said, oh no indeed, common labor is all you need. For those men can wreck in a day or two what builders have taken years to do. I asked myself as I went away, which kind of role am I to play? Am I the builder who builds with care, measuring life by rule and square? Or am I a wrecker who walks the town, content with the role of tearing down? And I'm telling you right now, we got a lot more people tearing down the truth of God's word than we do have carefully building upon the foundation which Jesus Christ has laid. Amen. There is no other foundation that can be laid except that which is laid in Christ Jesus. Amen. These words this morning set before us do not come just from the heart or the mind of the Apostle Paul. They come from the Holy Spirit of God, breathed out by God, so that we would understand our roles and our responsibilities as men and women. What kind of role model are you? This is a question you need to ask yourself this morning. Who looks to you to see how to love God and to live life? I heard a preacher say the other day, I love this, we as Christians no longer have home field advantage. Do y'all understand what that means? It is not the dominant theme which runs through our country. Ju uh, Christian Judeo values have gone out the window and secularism and humanism has sucked itself in. And we are no longer on the home field. We are as if we are the visiting team. And then as Russell Christian Academy would know and uh, as any, anybody would know is when you travel from your home's town, your home field, when you go away, the crowd is against you, amen, and the odds are against you as well. But when you have that home field advantage, when you have that hometown crowd, when you have the people who stand with you, there's a better chance of you winning than losing, is there not? Right. And that's why teams hate to travel out of town because they know that, man, it's better to have home field advantage. Well, there was a time when Christianity had the home field advantage in America. But I'm telling you all, no more do we have home field advantage. We are pilgrims and strangers in this land. Those who hold to the scriptures, those who hold to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 9 through 15. But as I said last week, let's not do forget. Man, the Bible covers every soul. Amen. Every role, every matter. As the Bible says, according to his divine power, he hath given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Amen. There's not an area in life which God has not prescribed or described for us to be able to hold to the truth of which God has said. Many people believe in God. But do you not know that the Bible says you believe? You say there's one God and you do well, but the devils also believe and tremble. Right. 
It doesn't matter if you believe in God. If you don't believe what God has said. And what God has said is in black and white, plain English, set down for us to hold not only in the years in which it was written, but until the end. For he says, those that endure to the end shall be saved. Amen. My word shall never pass away. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but not a jot nor a tittle of my word will ever pass. God's word does not change. And let me tell you, his word doesn't change, but God doesn't change himself. Amen. God says, I change not. <laughs> Amen. Jesus Christ said the same yesterday, today, and somebody say it with me. Forevermore. Amen. God stays the same. Christ stays the same. The Holy Spirit stays the same. And the Word of God stays the same. Man changes, but God does not. Amen. Man may try to bend and twist God's rules, but I tell you, God has not and will not bend to twist His rules to fit the society and the culture of America 2021. And so as we come together this morning, Oh boy, we have a great task set before us. They either look at this word with disdain and, 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 and upsetness in our guts. Like who in the world is this preacher to tell me what, how I ought to live? And first of all, I'd say if you came here and you get that, then my friends, you've come to the wrong place. Because I'm not telling you these things. The Holy Spirit of God is telling you these things. And so if they get you in your gut, then sat, sadly you need to take it up with the Lord and not me. But take your Bibles and... Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. Because I want you to go back just one verse and show you that he, he's very, very serious about the roles in which we play. You remember last week, uh, he, 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 he said the reason he wanted us to pray, he look, at me, look at me with it in verse 4 of Second Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Now watch what he says. The reason he asked us to pray for kings and authorities, those in whom we don't even like, those in whom we don't agree with, we should pray for them anyway because God said so. But notice what he said. What was the reason for that? Who will have what? All what? Men to be saved. Did he disconclude women then? Since he didn't save women? No. He used men here as a, for, a, a, a foreign, to, I mean, a, 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 a whole term to cover over mankind. He didn't just mean he only meant for men to be saved. Amen. He means for everybody to be saved. For he wishes that all would come to repentance. Amen. And faith in Jesus Christ. But he says he would have all men to come to the knowledge of truth. Then go over with me to verse 8. Because notice what he says here. I will therefore that what? Men pray what? Everywhere. So what happened to the women? Did he want the women to pray? Well, absolutely he wants the women to pray because he wants everybody to pray. Amen. And so sometimes when you see these words and they they're say men, it doesn't mean just men. It means the collective body as a whole. Mankind. Because guess what, women? You came from man, whether you like it or you don't like it. Okay? But please remember this, that God did not make a mistake when he reached down from the dust of the earth and put it into his hands, and formed it, and fashioned it, and made man. And into the nostrils of man did he breathe the breath of life, and man became a what? Living soul. Amen. And then from that man, he didn't set him to a side, and then pick up another clump of clay with his hands, and fashion it, and shape it, and make woman. She was not a separate creation. She was from the original creation, the head of creation. Whether you like it or you don't like it, I'm not a male chauvinist. I don't believe that women ought to not be able to have great places of prominence within inside the body of faith. But listen, or in the community, or in life, or in general. But there are roles in which we are now blending, that we are confusing. And I'm telling you, it's going to lead to greater demise, not greater security. Amen? It's only going to tear down the church of Christ. It's only going to tear up the world. And when you look at everything, Every other denomination under heaven right now, they're all struggling with the same thing. It's the roles and responsibilities of men and women inside the church. And I say, but listen, inside the church is just one issue. There's also roles and responsibilities in the home. There's roles and responsibilities in society. There's roles and responsibility in our community. And we all have a role to play. And God, man, says, listen, I would that therefore men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And then notice what it says. Look at me. Look at your Bible. Okay, so you'll know he speaks the transition into this section dealing with just women for a second. He doesn't stay here forever, but he is going to deal with some things. And I want you to see what he says because this is what we have to acknowledge here this morning, that these things be true, not because I say so, but because God's word says so. And in like manner also the what? So now women, okay? So now he's left men, supposedly, and he's moved off to what? Women. And so what I'm telling you is, is that it doesn't matter what's just on the outside, but it also matters 
what's on the inside. Amen. It doesn't matter just how you dress yourself up and come to church if your heart's not dressed up for church as well. Amen. And so as he picks up here, he's going to come and talk about a few things which church has lost. And Adrian Rogers, my favorite preacher of all time, was in the middle of summer. I can't remember what year it was, so forgive me for, for not remembering the year. But it was the middle of summer, and he was in the dead middle of preaching a sermon. And, uh, and he stopped. And he, and he just, he, he just hold the meter changes. You can find it probably online. But he stopped and he says, I have got a serious problem in my heart right now, and I just need to get it off my chest. He said, I am sick and tired of coming to Bellevue Baptist Church and feeling like I've come to Kentucky Fried Chicken. Because when I look out here, all I see is breast, legs, and thighs. Breast, legs, and thighs. Everywhere I look. I thought, whoa, he's, he just killed his ministry. He's fixing to get it, boy. They're to get him. But man, that was one of the most profound statements because man, when God says come into your house, cover yourself up, praise the Lord. You're not here to impress the king of heaven, amen, with your dress. And sometimes I feel the same way. I think, my goodness, I can't believe you walked into the house of God looking like that. I mean, what in the world? And sometimes it says men too. <laughs> Great day, dress yourself up, bro. You're going to be all right. But notice what he says here, because I'm just saying this is what God's word says, so you can take it with a grain of salt or not. But listen to what he says, because it does matter personally. If you're writing these things down, the, in, the outside and the inside matters personally, right? So notice what he says. In like manner also, the women adorn themselves in what? Modest apparel. And simply what that means is cover yourself up, ladies. That's what it means. Whether you like it or you don't like it, I know the, less, the more skin, the more, you, the, more, the more you show, the better off you feel, right? Listen, that's great, wonderful, praise the Lord. But it's not a good thing. It is a good thing in the context in which God meant for it to be shown. It's a great thing, amen? Because how many of y'all know that the attraction between a male and a female is a good thing? Say amen. Some of y'all said, well, it was when he was 20. <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to loosen y'all up so y'all don't get so upset with me this morning, okay? <laughs> One of the hardest things I've had to do lately is, is, is my wife really loves going to the beach. Y'all like going to the beach? Say amen. amen. Yeah, that's a great place. Problem with going to the beach, though, is, man, I'm killing myself all day long asking for forgiveness. And there's, I want to make a question to you, parents in the room. Would you allow your daughters to come to Rossville Christian Academy in their bra and panties? No. There ain't a mother in this room. There is a, not a mother in this room that would say yes to that. Not one. And yet you will send them out in broad public in less material than is usually in a pair of bra and panties. And we call it okay for the sake of a swimsuit because it's cute. I don't care what you say. God is never proud of us showing off our skin. Matter of fact, when sin happened and they saw that they were naked, the Bible says that they sewed fig leaves together and they tried to cover themselves up so there would have been this little teeny tiny patch here, a little teeny tiny patch here, a little teeny tiny patch here. And when they went before God, God said, Whoa, oh, you think that, that ain't going to cut it, bro? I'm going to make some clothes for you, amen? I'm going to cover you up, praise the Lord. Now listen, I know some of y'all going to walk there and say, well, I ain't coming back that church no more. <laughs> and that's fine. That's fine. Because I'm not here to please you. I'm here to preach the truth of God's Amen. word. Amen. But it's breaking my heart that we're now joining in society and calling things good that the Bible says is wrong. Or as vice versa. They shall call evil good and good evil. How dare you, preacher? Well, how dare the word of God to tell the women when they came to church they had to dress modestly? You see what I'm saying? And if it don't happen here, where is it going to happen, ladies? And so this is a sermon detailed directly towards you this morning. And I didn't say it. So don't go out of here saying, well, that preacher down there, well, he needs all of my clothes. I'm tell him all my stuff showing. Well, that's not what I said. That's what God says. Amen. Cover yourself up. Praise the Lord. God knows what you look like. Praise the Lord. He created you and shaped you and made you. And the only person to ever see you ought to be the man in whom you marry. Amen. He should be the only person that has the privilege of knowing your curviness. 
It's not made for the world. It's made for the marriage bed. And it's holy. And God says, keep it undefiled. And one way you start that is by the way you dress. Now, I'm not saying don't come fancy. You know what I used to love is when the women used to come to church with their hats and their dresses. And I remember that day. Some of y'all just laughed. I ain't never going back there, brother. I got my slacks on and my shirt. Well, fine. Wear your slacks and wear your shirt. I don't care. But make it a modest apparel. Amen? Make it modest. Don't come in here showing off skin while people are trying to attune their eyes to the Lord God above, getting men distracted all over the place. This ain't a place to fulfill the lust of your bodies nor your flesh. Amen. This is a place to seek the face of God and say, Oh God, train my heart to know you. Amen. To know your ways, to live how you've called me to live, to play my role. It's not my words. And then notice what he says. I mean, listen, he... Because listen, the outside's fine. Look what he says, though. In like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel. Now, you do know he is talking about in the context of the church. So let me just go ahead and get that out, on, out in front. He is talking about in the context of a worship service. That you come in dressed in modest apparel. But I, don't, I guarantee you that he does not want you to come in here and be one thing and go out there and be another. You know what they call that? A hypocrite. So you can go do that if you want to, but in the context of what he says here. But notice what it says. He says, not only should you dress in a model apparel, but he says, with shamefacedness and sobriety. That means with reserve and contentment. That you're not here to impress people. You're here to seek the face of God Almighty. Amen. Your creator and maker. That's what that means. With reserve and respect for the Lord above. You're not here to impress people. And my wife gets on me all the time. She says, listen, honey, I promise you these women ain't dressing for, for men. They're dressing for other ladies that say, ooh, ooh you look pretty this morning. Uh, and I say, well, I don't care if it's for men or women. We're not there to get the approval from men. We're there to get the approval from God, amen. The favor from the Lord God who made us and gave us life who said, you get the opportunity to come and worship and to seek my face. And so he says, men, please put on some clothes. But then notice what he says, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. So you can put all that stuff and come in here strutting like a fine, fine chicken if you want to. But you ain't pressing, you ain't pressing, impressing God. And why do you come to church to impress people? No, you come here to impress God. God, don't look on my outside, but what I need you to do is look on where? On the inside this morning, search me and try me and see if there be any wicked way found in me. For Lord, I want to do that which is pleasing to the God who's given me life. The world has lost it. Don't y'all know that? But now we're allowing it to creep into the church and pastors won't preach the word. Well, I say, do you think I want to preach this this morning? Y'all look at me. Do, do you think I want to preach this this morning? You know why? Because there may be people who's visiting here this morning. I said, God, Lord, on a day where there might be some visitors, you going to make me preach this message? Because I can tell you the women ain't going to like it. And if the mama ain't happy, then daddy ain't happy, and they ain't coming back. Praise the Lord. I can just go ahead and tell you, because that's what every man says, man. Mama ain't happy. No. Daddy ain't happy. We're shooting for you. keep mama happy. That's exactly what Adam did. And all of mankind fell into sin. He compromised to keep Eve happy. And he did it knowing that he sinned. Eve, as he said, was deceived. But he knew what he was doing, and he still made her own choice. But now, ladies, let me just say this. She was perfect in every way. <laughs> I can understand the pressure. <laughs> Don't make that one mad, amen? But nevertheless, I'm just simply saying it matters. The outside and the inside matters personally. You need to hold that in your heart before a holy God who says, I made you and I'm asking you that in the presence of sin that you cover yourself up, not try to show more of yourself off. Simple and easy. Not my word, God's word. Notice a second thing. It not only matters on the personal level, but it matters on the corporate level. Notice as what I say. Remember, First and second Timothy, he's writing to a pastor. The, the pastor's name is Timothy, and he is to be setting things in order. If you go uh, back uh, to Ch Timothy chapter 1, I want you to pick up with me there in verse 3. And he says these words. He says, but he says, Timothy, I, I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, 
when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest teach some, that, that, that I'm sorry, that thou mightest charge some, that they teach no other doctrine. So he says, the reason I'm writing you to this word is there's problems that are coming into what? The church. And when we start accepting the things outside and bring it inside, it's going to destroy what? The church. The world has lost its mind. Let's please not lose the church too. Amen. Let's hold the pillar and ground of truth as a shining light for God's glory until the end comes. We may not be light, but we will be winners. Amen. <laughs> And so, man, notice what he says. He says, I besought thee that they teach no other doctrine. Verse 4, neither giving heed to fables or endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than what? Godly edification, which is in faith. Do so. So he says, you're preaching, Timothy, ought to edify the body. It ought to bring them from a worldly mindset into a godly mindset. It ought to bring them from the unrighteousness into the righteous. It ought to bring them out of the unholy into the holy. Amen. When they come to church, they need to be built up in Christ Jesus. They need to learn their roles and their responsibilities. They need to learn that there's a God in heaven who not only has roles and responsibilities, but he wants to use them in a mighty way. And we're going to deal with this issue here in a couple of weeks again because he's, he has to not only talk about it once but twice these issues but now let's see because see now notice what he says here the corporate issue because notice what he says verse 11 let the women learn in silence with all subjection ladies look at me what, did, what does God's word say that in the corporate setting what does the God's word say now, you can say, well, now the culture's changed, Brother Toby. And I say, well, guess what? I don't care if the culture changed. God didn't change. Amen? You don't like it. Hey, listen, I didn't make the rules. Praise the Lord. I got to play by them. But he says, now watch this. Because he says, verse 12, But I suffer not a woman to teach or to usurp authority over a what? Now, this is really key. Not to usurp authority over what? A man. So the only context in which he's talking about women not being able to speak or to teach inside the church is from that Sunday morning authoritative position when the man of God is supposed to stand with the word of God and preach the word of God to the people who need to conform to it. Amen? It's not in any other aspect of church life for we do know that as Paul was writing to Timothy and talking about how he had come to faith, he says, listen, I know the faith which lies in you which was once taught to you by the scriptures, the holy scriptures which your mother Eunice and grandmother taught you. So women are to be a great part of the church in building up the body and edifying it. But when it comes to the Sunday morning experience, they were having other women get up in the middle of that experience, which God says is not permitted. And taking over that authoritative position. Because sadly, you are not the authoritative figure on earth man is. Whether you like it or you don't. I don't like it because quite frankly, sometimes I think the women do a much better job than the men do. They're certainly more knowledgeable about the scriptures. They're certainly more kind and loving and compassionate. And they certainly sing louder in church. <laughs> but do you know that every form, everything in which the temple was done in any kind of capacity and leadership was done by men? And sadly, men, it's pathetic that we have to ask you to serve the living God. To be the representatives that you ought to be in your homes and in your church. That you are responsible for leading your family in the spiritual things of your home. It's not the mother to do that. It's the man to do that. Amen. God has called the men to lead the homes and to lead the church. Because that is God's design. Man was created first and then woman was created as a what? So I'm going to make for him a what? Not a usurper. And what did happen when the first woman usurped her authority? Did it turn out okay in the end? It did not. And I don't know why we think it's going to change today. It will not. And God says in the context of the church, in the time of Sunday morning gathering when the authority of God's word is going out, as thus saith the Lord God, that is reserved not for women but for a man to hold. Amen? Now you can argue with me that we'll pick it up later but corporately here's what Paul says let the women learn in subjection with all I mean with, with silence with all su subjection but I suffer not a woman to teach or to usurp authority over a man but to be in what 
Silence. So now listen, it's 2021. I realize it. And some of you ladies probably don't like that verse. I get it. I get it. There's a lot of scripture that sometimes I don't like either. <laughs> but you know what God says? I didn't write it for you to like it. I wrote it for you to obey it. Now how you take that, how you deal with that, that's your own choice. But I promise you this, that as the pastor of this fellowship, I am not going to compromise God's word for your personal feelings. Right. Not going to do it. Now listen, you can fire me tomorrow if you don't like it. Praise the Lord. Get a council together, fire me. But I'm not going to compromise what Scripture says here. And Scripture is the one that said it, not me. Amen. Amen? Amen? Just so that we're on the same page. Hey, listen, my paycheck doesn't come from you. My paycheck comes from the Lord. If you fire me today, my God will still provide for me. Amen? I'm telling you. I am going to stick to the stuff of the words of God. Because now, now listen, the inside and the outside not only matters personally and corporately, but it also matters genetically. And here's what I'm talking about here. Oh, boy, this is really good. <laughs> We've got this all messed up in the world, and it is really getting into the church today, too. Notice what it says here, verse 4. I mean, verse 13. For Adam was formed, what? Genetically, he was the first to be formed. Man was the first to be formed, genetically. But listen, when God made man, he didn't just make man. He made man and what? No, yeah, female, right? Male and female, or man and woman. And let me tell you, I don't care what science says today, there are only two genders given by God, and it's male and female. Amen? Amen. There's no science that's going to overrule God, because in the beginning, God created them male and female. In the beginning, he created him. In the likeness of him, he created him male and female. Huh. Now, sin, I agree, sin has crept in, and it has messed up all kind of stuff. Amen? <laughs> It, it genetically has messed up people's bodies where they feel differently than the body in which they're born in. But I don't care what your feelings are. The role and the responsibility is that if I'm born a male, I'm still a male. Amen. Does it matter how I feel? Or if I'm a woman, I'm still a woman. Because I'm telling you, sometimes I just feel like lying. But guess what lying is? Lying is what? Wrong. Amen. Sometimes I feel like murder would be a good thing for me to do. But guess what? Murder is still what? Wrong. Sometimes I feel like adultery might be a good thing. But guess what? God said what? It's wrong. Sometimes I feel like just getting slammer, drammer, drunk. But guess what God says? That's wrong. And we'll all sit here and say, yes, that's wrong. Yes, that's wrong. But now the church is starting to say that God made me this way, so therefore God will love me like I am. No, when God made you, he made you a male or he made you a female and he does not allow the two sexes to come together. They are separate. And I just want to read to you, because remember what I said earlier, I want you to write that statement down, that biblical information without spiritual transformation is a what? An abomination. Now, I want to read to you why I say that because here's what it says in Leviticus chapter 18, and this is going to come over to the New Testament too. But Leviticus 18, 22 says this, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. Let me say that again in Leviticus 20, 13. If a man also lie with mankind, just so that we get it really straight in line, as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. Now the world is starting to say and blame this on God. That God created me this way and I can't help whom I love. Yes, you can. <laughs> Absolutely you can. And you better. Or else you will not make it to the kingdom of heaven. For do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven? Neither thieves, nor drunkards, nor extortioners, nor idolaters, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor any such thing shall inherit the kingdom of heaven. It's not that I didn't have the desire to be drunk one time because guess what, y'all? I wasn't always a saved man. I promise you there were many times when I was slobbering drunk. There was many times when I was living life outside the bounds in which God had given me bounds to live in. Amen? And he didn't do that to, to, to hinder me. He did that to help me. Amen? He put parameters on my life to teach me in the way that I should go. Because I don't know the way to go. And without the word of God, I'd be lost. Amen? And so it's no wonder, y'all, listen to me, why so many people are so confused today in this world about who they are, whether they're a male or a female or, or now. I'm not neither. I'm a non-binary, non-gender cis. cis I, I don't even know all the words they come up with now. It's a crazy mess. 
Y'all listen to me, it's a crazy mess. But listen, the church is now ordaining homosexuals to preach the word of God. And you say, golly, you can't believe that. Well, you know what else they're ordaining to preach the word of God? Women. You know what God said about that? No. And just this past few months, it's gone by with all the things that's going on with inside the Southern Baptist Convention. One of our largest churches, uh, uh, Rick Warren. How many of y'all know Rick Warren, Purpose Driven Life? Ha ha, that was a great book, wasn't it? I love that book. That book reached me in prison. Ha ha, I finally figured out it wasn't about me. It was about God, amen? Very first line of the book. It's not about you. It's about God. Purpose Driven Life. And now all of a sudden, biggest church in our, one of the biggest churches in our denomination ordained three women as pastors. Now, I'm gonna, I, want you, I want you to catch this. Every denomination, you can go back and fact check me if you want. Every denomination that has raised women to the authority of a pastor, elder, bishop, or overseer have all now embraced not only homosexuality, but abortion. See, we're going, hmm, I can't believe. Listen to me. This is why truth must be heralded, regardless of how it offends people who sit in the pews. Amen? Amen, amen. There's a God in heaven who says yes and a God who says no. And if he says no, it's still no. But if he said yes, you can do it all you want to, amen? For against such there is no law. Man, don't you wish that we had love and joy and peace, the fruits of the Spirit of what? Love, joy, and what? Are we experiencing that? My goodness, you wonder why? Because we're compromising God's word and we're doing what God told us not to do and then expect God to bless us and, and, and work with us. And God says, I, sorry, I won't do that. But man is confused about this issue because he doesn't really know who he is. And so notice what he says here, verse 14. I'm almost finished, I promise. Man, we're, we're, we're going to get there. He says, for Adam was formed first and then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in transgression. Now, not only does it matter genetically because God made male and female, and I, I don't want to be the dead horse to death, but it also matters sal sal salvifically, okay? That's a big word, salvifically. It just means salvation. So I'm showing you how smart I am, right? So y'all can go and say, well, that country preacher knows a big word. Praise the Lord. <laughs> salvifically, this matters. Now, I'm going to show you what I mean by that. Verse 15, he says, well, verse 14, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in transgression, notwithstanding she shall be saved in what? So women in here, look at me. Please know that this does not mean that if you bear children, you're saved. But it matters genetically because guess what? Only women can give what? Men may have the seed, a woman has the womb. And when we start getting these two mixed up, listen to me. We start violating God's law and we start saying, I'm no longer a male. I'm a female. I'm no longer a female. I'm a male. I'm no longer this. I'm no longer that. As a matter of fact, I don't want to be anything. I think I'll be X. <laughs> and we go, what's, what's wrong with people? And I say, man, the Bible's told you what's wrong with people. The devil, the prince of darkness, has blinded their hearts and minds that they cannot know the truth. And matter of fact, the truth is foolishness to them. Man, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to a world that is perishing, but it's the only thing that can save us. And so what he's saying here is, please remember that, listen, if you call me Lord, then you're supposed to obey what I say, amen? And what I told you from the beginning, go to Genesis chapter 3 and look at the curse. And look at the salvation that God promised in that curse. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 was the promise of the gospel that we would be saved. But notice what it says very from, from the beginning, and he just reiterated it here. Man, the Lord tells us what we need to do to be saved. Stay inside the roles and responsibilities which God has given to you. And so in verse 15, notice what it says. He says, but I will put enmity between thee and the woman's seed and thy seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy head and that shall bruise his heel. And unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow in thy what? Conception. This is all about childbirth. And then notice what it says though. This is very, 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 very important. And in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. Now watch it. Watch it. Don't, don't stop there. Look at the very next line. 
and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over you. You know what a simpler translation says? Your desire is you're going to want to usurp your husband's authority, but he shall rule over you. You're supposed to stay in your role. It's not through childbearing that you're actually saved. It's you by obeying what God said you are, your primary responsibility would be. And that is the home and the taking care of the children. And then if there's other space and other time without sight of that, because you want to know what happens when you take the children, you send them to school and you teach them things they ought not to learn. They grow up into adults. You know why the government's after our school system so bad? So we can change our children. Y'all remember that video I showed you a couple of weeks ago? Everybody was so mad because I showed it. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> it was supposed to make you mad. Because what he's saying in that song is true. They're coming after your children. And mama, let me tell you something. There's no greater influence on a nation than a mother who is at home teaching her children how to love the Lord God with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength to know what God has said about them and how He has created them and the roles that they're to play, not only in the generations in the past, but also the generations in the present. For if we don't hold on to the truth, where will truth go, y'all? Listen to me. We'll be like this right here, and we won't have no power to do anything. And matter of fact, we'll be absolutely useless to accomplish the goals and the tasks we've been given to do. Without the power of God and the truth of God, we're absolutely useless. But what happens? The moment you get hooked up to the Spirit of God, woo, now we can go to work. Praise the Lord. So for you men, I think you've made a better connection with this illustration than women did. For women, if the man didn't have the tools to build the home, you wouldn't have a home to pretty up. Amen. And my wife would tell me, hey, listen here. The inside belongs to me. <laughs> the outside belongs to you. You go out there and work, and I'm going to do the stuff in here. And I say, praise God. <laughs> praise God. Because when I was a bachelor, people come over my eyes and be like, whoa. But now that I have a wife, they come over and say, man, y'all's house is beautiful. That doesn't come from man. That comes from woman. Amen. She was made to be a home maker, keeper, provider, and protector. Amen. Ladies, you have a tremendous role. I'm out of time. I wish there was more I could say, but I'll be back next Sunday. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> and we will pick up. And as I said, listen, sometimes you get up and you start preparing for the sermon and you think, man, oh Lord, please, don't let them hear me today. Let them hear Jesus. Sirs, we would see Jesus. If you don't hold these words, if you don't follow them, if he's not the Lord, you're never going to see Jesus. Or I should say when you see Jesus, you won't be proud. You've got to see him because he's coming in judgment and authority and power. Amen. When he comes. But I'm telling you this. And one day he's going to suck me up into the heavens and I'm going to meet him face to face. Not because of what I have done, but because of what Jesus has done. And because he's brought me to his word. He's taught me his truth. He sanctified me and he's going to glorify me. Is that true for you this morning? Say amen. amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that even so sometimes it's hard for us to digest. It's hard for us to handle and hold. But, oh, God, I pray that we would shuck off our own feelings and our own situations and our own experiences and recognize that our feelings and our experiences don't trump your word. And that, God, no matter what I feel, I'm to line my heart and soul up with what you have said and what you have done. And you died for this sin of usurping our authorities and not playing our roles, not doing what we've been designed and created to do. And it's no wonder the world is so confused. It doesn't know who it is because it's lost the truth of who it's supposed to be. If you're here this morning and you know you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I'm going to be standing to my left here right here just a second. This is your opportunity to respond to the truth of God's Word. Don't fight against the pricks. Don't kick against the pricks, I mean. Don't fight against the Lord God. Just surrender to Him. I promise you, you'll be much happier living the way God told you to live than the way you choose to live. For the Bible says, for all of sin and comes short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. The reason there's so much death around us in the world is because it, the world is dead in sin. 
But I have come to give life and life more abundant. If you need life and Jesus wants to give it to you this morning, I promise you he'll make these things not be offensive to you. He'll make them a joy to you. He'll make you want to surrender to them. And so I pray that if you need Christ, you'll come. If you need a church home to put your family in, to teach them truth, I promise you we will hold the banner high. We will hold the truth as a standard, the scriptures which got our hearts and minds. And if you need a church to put your family in, this is a church I believe you need to now because we're losing, we're losing quickly places of truth. Or maybe you just need to come and pray this morning for a soul you know that's in desperate need of God moving upon it. And these altars are here for you. But whatever you do, I pray you do it all now in the name of our wonderful and matchless Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his name I pray. Amen. Stand with us and join together and sing, Lord, I need you, Lord, I need you.